Welcome back. As you were, yields up, stocks down. We're down nine tenths of one percent from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, equity softer as Walmart forecasts a rocky year. President Biden speaking in Poland after visiting Kyiv and Credit Suisse stock hits a fresh all-time low. We begin with the big issue, the bearish roar growing even louder. Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson delivering another warning. The bear market rally that began in October from reasonable prices and low expectations has morphed into a speculative frenzy based on a Fed pause pivot that isn't coming. JP Morgan's Mislav Mateka elaborating on that, writing we could indeed see a Fed pivot, but perhaps only in response to a much more problematic macro setup than the market is currently looking forward to. While Mohamed Al Arian says the Fed can't hit its target without crushing the economy. I don't think they can get CPI um, to 2% without crushing the economy, but that's because 2% is not the right target for our economy. When you have so much stuff going on on the supply side, an energy transition, a change in the supply chains, geopolitical issues that come onto the supply side, the way the labor market functions. It's a long list of supply issues. You need a higher stable inflation rate, call it 3 to 4 percent. Joining us now to discuss, JP Morgan, Stephanie Roth, Nuveen's Tony Rodriguez today, both of you. Thanks for being with us. Stephanie, first to you, the S&P 500 year today up 6 percent, the Nasdaq up close to 13 percent. To build on some of Mike Wilson's work over at Morgan Stanley, just how much oxygen is left up here? Yeah, I think the, the risk is very much to the downside from here. The market seems to be pricing in this really optimistic outcome that, that I, don't think is, I don't think is right. I think the narrative right now is, is wrong to some extent. There's this, there's this excitement about the data that we've seen that Payrolls came in really strong and retail sales came in really strong. A lot of that is, is seasonal noise and we have to look through that to some extent. And what we're seeing is inflation that's sticky and an economy that, that's showing some cracks beneath the surface. So from, from our view, we do like core fixed income here. We think REITs should, should eventually come back down. And we're, we're cautious about equity, equity risk at the, at the moment. We do think that there could be some more downside. Tony, my head is spinning. We've gone from soft landing to hard landing to no landing at all. Which one is it? Well, Jonathan, you're not the only one whose head is spinning. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of volatility here in the data. Uh, our view, though, is really that what's happened is that we're clearly entering the year a bit stronger than what we had expected. So whereas we were talking about, say, a mild, shallow, short recession in the middle of the year, that's getting pushed out as we're seeing greater resiliency in the job market with the consumer. But it hasn't really changed the overall narrative that we still expect to see a moderation in growth as we move later in the year. Our shallow recession call may have to move to a soft landing call. It certainly has to be pushed out later into the fourth quarter, maybe even early 24. But overall, we're still expecting to see that moderation in growth, a slowdown in inflation, but we certainly agree that it's going to be sticky. So we're not hitting a 2% target, certainly not this year, probably not even in 2024. But the base case for us right now is a either soft landing or very mild recession that we're pushing that out later this year to early next. What totally upended all of this was the January economic data, whether it was payrolls, CPI, PPI, retail sales, all coming in higher, punchier than expected, and all of a sudden <coughs> people are scratching their heads. Stephanie, I think you touched on this, and this is important. The question is whether the February data confirms January, and to what extent within that January data is there more noise than signal? Which one is it for you? I think a lot of the, the noise uh, that we saw in January was, was exactly that. It was noise. Uh, payrolls are incredibly difficult to seasonally adjust around January, especially in the post-COVID period. Same with retail sales. Every January, on average, you have sharp job losses. So on average, you have about 3 million job losses. This time, we had 2.5 million. So it's really, really difficult to decipher within the seasonal, within the seasonal volatility. So I think the trend is that the data are, are certainly more resilient than many had expected. But it's not this acceleration that, that the January data would point to. So February, we should see a give back in a lot of the data. Uh, Tony, this is the problem. We're told that we're data dependent. The Fed's data dependent. We should be data dependent. How dependable is the data? Well, Jonathan, it's certainly going to be volatile. So, but our view uh, in agreement really is that 
we do need to see confirmation in the February data and probably even the March data as we move beyond the next Fed meeting. Because right now the question mark is just, is the Fed going to have to go the next two meetings, three meetings, or even further? Our views are clearly going to go the next two. We don't think they step up to a 50 basis point pace. And we do think that the June meeting is now significantly more in play than it had been. But our view is still that we are going to see that moderation. You're not going to see a six handle Fed funds rate unless the January data, in fact, is a trend that's being created for the US economy. Our view, though, is that there are those seasonal impacts that hit those numbers, and we should see some moderation as we see the February and then the March data. Yields are up this morning by six basis points on a two year. Your two year right now, 468 on a 10 year up seven basis points to 389. A little bit later this hour, we get US PMIs. The PMIs out of Europe this morning, better than expected, services improving. Mike McKee, the next stop for the Fed speak, I guess, is Fed minutes tomorrow. Yeah, we're all going to be watching that. Uh, unfortunately, a little bit of the surprise is gone. But when you look at the calendar ahead, it's heavily weighted toward the end of the week, starting tomorrow with the Fed minutes. We also get existing home sales today. We'll see what the housing industry is doing. But uh, we get jobless claims on Thursday. That's always been a surprise. And then Friday, as I mentioned, income spending and PCE inflation along with a lot of Fed speak this week. We'll see what people are thinking about going into March. March really starts off Friday with the PCE numbers on inflation, particularly for core services. The minutes, though, uh, the surprise is gone. Loretta Mester already <laughs> revealed that she wanted to go 50 or thought there was a case for 50. Jim Bullard did, too. Uh, who else, though? We'll be looking to see if there is a larger group that thinks they need to go 50 basis points. We'll see what they say about the terminal rate, whether that's raised from five and a quarter to five and a half percent or so. Uh, and then rates and the recession outlook. They want to keep rates higher for longer. But do they think a recession is getting closer or farther away? And then, of course, as I mentioned, the inflation outlook services X housing. Bring up that chart. This is the new favorite one for uh, Jay Powell and the Fed. Uh, they think that that blue line has to come down. That's uh, services. Take out housing services because we know the housing numbers distort the overall inflation picture because they're delayed. And you have an idea of what the Fed thinks the inflation outlook is. So a lot to look forward to as we get towards the end of the week and then we uh, start to roll over into March and the jobs report, the CPI report and all the things that will help the Fed make their final decision. Mike, let's go back to the start of February if we can. You were in the room with Chairman Powell. He was asked about whether they had discussed a pause at that Fed meeting and he said look to the minutes. I'm trying to work out, Mike, whether this is to stage a platform for the Hawks or the Doves in the minutes to come tomorrow. Well, that's an interesting question, and we will find out about uh, pause. But the problem here is that uh, the data since Jay Powell spoke have kind of made that uh, no longer an operative view, because uh, if we see this kind of strength going forward, there won't be a pause. And if we see real weakness, then the pause comes back into effect. So uh, three-week-old minutes, unfortunately, don't give us necessarily a good view into what's happening down the road. Mike McKee, thank you. A lot of people have changed their call recently. Goldman's Jan Hatzius said just last week, in light of the stronger growth and firmer inflation news, we're adding a 25 basis point rate hike in June to our forecast. They now have a peak of 525 to 550. We caught up with them recently. Take a listen. We've seen some higher inflation numbers for January. I don't necessarily think that that breaks the trend towards disinflation, but I think it reinforces the idea that the Fed still has work to do and so we think another 75 basis points from here with no cuts until 2024 seemed like a more likely outcome. Stephanie Roth, to come to you on some of that, a lot of people have changed their projection for the so-called terminal rate, the peak red rate in this hiking cycle from the Federal Reserve. I've got a two-year at 470 again. Is there much upside risk there around that story at the front end of the curve, given what's already priced? I think there's a little bit of risk, um, but right now the market seems to have adjusted to, to the data that have come out. And given that our view is that the, the February data should show a, a bit of a reversal to some extent, I think what's in the price makes sense. Um, I think the, the, the March payrolls are going to be one of the most important things, and it's unfortunate that it comes in a, a week later than, than normally would be the case. So March 10th is going to be a long ways away. But I do think what's in the price makes sense for, for what the Fed will do, given what's, what's played out over the data uh, over the past couple of weeks. Uh, Tony, a Treasury's a buy here. 
You know, Jonathan, I think that they are certainly, uh, at worst case, neutral or possibly a buy, though. In the long end, they're much closer to buy than the front end. That uh, question mark about, say, whether there's going to be another 25 base points at the June meeting, that is really going to drive the two-year. We could see the two-year hitting 5%, so that twos, tens inversion, whereas as we came into the year, we thought it would be in a 50 to 75 base point range. Now you're looking at maybe 75 to as much as 100 basis points. But when we look at the long run of the curve, there I think we are pricing in both the Fed movement and the implications of that for the economy. So as we expect to see that slowdown in the second half of the year, we think that you'll see the 10-year rate dropping more into the 3 to 3.5% three zone rather than the 35 to 4% that we've been living in so far this year. Two-year, ten-year spread right now, close to negative 80. Stephanie, you'll also recall that we came into this year and people were looking for a break, a break in the correlation between risks, say equities, and what happens in bonds. At the moment, though, it's stocks down, bonds down, yields up. Where's that break coming? Yeah, it feels a little bit like early 2022 yet again. We don't think that will take that much longer for for the the benefit between the stock bond correlation to to come into play. I, I would think around the February data, once we see that economic growth is actually weakening, I think we should see a negative correlation return in, in, in stock, stocks and bonds again. Attorney, do you agree? We do. We, uh, we think that you will see a negative correlation return. It might take a little bit here through the next couple of months of data just to confirm that the January strength is not going to continue here and we, in fact, get the economy taking off. But we do think you'll see that. And then you'll see that correlation return to the pre-pandemic you know, uh, levels. It's only out of interest. What would change your mind? If it wasn't the January data, what would? It would be a confirmation of that January data. So when you look at the jobs data, you'd have to see continued, you know, 300,000 plus uh, type of monthly numbers with the unemployment rate continue to go down. That is going to create a very hawkish Fed. So in our minds, really, the strength of the data would merely just delay the hard landing that would happen because the Fed would have to take the funds rate to a much higher level than what we're currency, currently expecting. But we do think you'll see moderation both in the labor market and what you see from, a, from the consumer in terms of services spending, good spending, et cetera. I so guess but that data is what would change our mind. It's some scenario analysis, Stephanie, that we, maybe we can throw at you as well. If the February data did confirm January, how would it change your view? Yeah, I think that would mean uh, a bigger recession later. So this concept of, of no landing I don't think makes sense. I think really what it means is a harder landing but later. So that would be more like a 2024 recession as opposed to the 2023 recession that we're expecting. Stephanie, so if we defined what a no landing is yet, it feels so loosely defined still. It sure does. I don't exactly know what that means. I really think it means a harder landing but later. And that would be a 2024 recession. It means the Fed would have to go more than what's in the price and cause a, a bigger recession at the end of the day. Again, not our view. We think that there's enough in the price to, to cause a material slowdown later this year, but that's the risk. It's only final word on that. The final word, Jonathan, is probably that uh, no landing is really just French for delayed hard landing. So <laughs> our expectations, you will see softening in the, in the economic picture as you move through the rest of the year. You're on the same page. Stephanie Roth, Tony Rodriguez sticking with us. Coming up, President Biden rallying Eastern Europe. One year later, Kyiv stands, and Ukraine stands, democracy stands, the Americans stand with you, and the world stands with you. The president in Poland today tackling tensions with Russia and China. We're live next. Bracing for the fall of Kyiv. One year later, Kyiv stands, and Ukraine stands, democracy stands, the Americans stand with you, and the world stands with you. President Biden visiting Poland after a surprise trip to Kyiv, meeting with Eastern European leaders and hoping to rally support for Ukraine. This is Russian President Vladimir Putin holds the country's nuclear pact with the U.S. and vows the press on, saying in an address to Parliament, quote, we will fulfill the task set step by step, carefully and consistently. Our team coverage begins right now with Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Brussels and AMH over in Warsaw. And Marie, first to you, what you've heard from the president in the last 24 hours, what you expect to hear in the next couple of hours. 
Well, Jonathan, fresh off that trip to Kiev, this one that was shrouded in secrecy, the president finally made that scheduled trip to Warsaw. He had the bilateral meeting. He's in that extended bilateral now, we got some comments at the top with his Polish counterpart, President Duda. And one comment that really stood out was the fact when the president said the United States needs Poland and NATO just as much as NATO needs the United States. And he's talking about how this is paramount, this security alliance when it comes to NATO. He said it's the most consequential security alliance in history. And that's going to be a, a tagline that carries throughout the day and through tomorrow. Tonight, he'll be giving really I mean from what we saw from Moscow but 800 miles away we're right now from President Putin President Biden is going to make sure that this support there this war fatigue potentially that's starting to creep up around the world as they mark one year on remains uh, the fact that the allies he wants to make sure they remain committed to supporting and funding Ukraine. Maria, great to have you with us as well. Maria can you compare and contrast what we heard from the president of the United States and what we heard from Russia's leader? Look, I think from Vladimir Putin today, it was a repetition of this very Russian line that he is fighting for the soul of Russia, that he is fighting for the historical lands, the historical truth uh, of Russia, and the operation, as you alluded to, will continue. When you look at that speech, uh, in some ways, he repeated what has been the standard, the standard line from the Kremlin. The operation may not look like it's moving fast, but the reality is Russia is not just fighting Ukraine, it is fighting the West and NATO, and this is why things are not going quickly. And the Russian president obviously knows and his people know that this is an operation and a war that's been going on for a year. This is not the fast and easy job that they expected would happen. The Russian people are very aware. They may not protest uh, in numbers, but they are very aware the Russian men are dying in the front and they are dying in Ukraine. The justification for it is that Russia is being attacked by bigger powers in Ukraine. This is a pawn in a much bigger global war. That's essentially what Russia uh, would say. Now, we also had some comments on the nuclear disarmament uh, treaty. Remember, the president uh, suggested, the Russian president, that Russia will suspend its participation, not pull out entirely, but suspend it uh, for the time being. And to me, it's also interesting, the conversations that we, he will be having with the top Chinese diplomat uh, this week. Remember, the Chinese have said they have a peace formula for Ukraine. I can tell you, Jonathan, I spoke to a top European official who told me he is, quote, curious, but also very concerned about this peace plan from the Chinese. He wanted They've done nothing for a year. What do they want to mediate now? And then, two, they cannot pass off a land grab as a just peace for Ukraine. That is something the West could not and must not allow. Maria, just briefly, the situation last year, we had this big economic threat hanging over the global economy, particularly in Europe as well. And, Maria, that was able, the leaders of Europe were able to use that to leverage and get support for Ukraine and the war effort. Maria, looking at the data this morning, the data looks so much better. How are they going to keep on doing that? Uh, yes, and also, by the way, just this time a year ago, remember, uh, Russia's uh, spokesman, spokesman for Vladimir Putin, Mr. Pascal, told the world that Russia had no plans, by the way, to invade Ukraine. We know that was a very different situation, and they did invade. It's now a full-scale war going into a year. Now, to answer your question, I think for a lot of European leaders, there is relief that their plan to pull away from Russian oil. Gas has worked to some extent. It has come at a price, but we see gas prices also coming down. And then, two, that their interventions in the fiscal support has worked. I think the bigger question it's not the next few to three months it will be what do we do in the next uh, winter but overall yes there is relief in Europe that the worst case scenario did not manifest and I have spoken to many officials who told me Vladimir Putin made a bet that Europe would freeze and that the economy would crumble that did not happen a lot of it because the weather was also mild that is a luck component true to this. true it just did not materialize for many reasons AMH Maria to the two of you fantastic as always bank with us for a final word Stephanie Roth Tony Rodriguez Stephanie the data out of Europe better Better. Germany, better. The UK, better. The services PMI picking up and yields are pushing higher too. When you think about Treasuries and what the Fed might do, how important is the global backdrop to all of this as well? The global backdrop is certainly important, but I would say the domestic factors are going to be the primary driver here. So certainly the, the Europe backdrop looks better. That's one reason why we're, we're recommending uh, European equities here uh, over, over US, at least for the incremental dollar. Um, but when it comes to, to the Fed, they really have to get a handle on domestic inflation, and that's not really driven by, by the global backdrop at this point. It's really driven by the tight labor market. So wages are the most important thing for the Fed. Tony, a U.S. story or a global one? 
Well, I agree that the uh, U.S. wage data is going to be the most important, but we think it is a global story. It's really that resilience that we're seeing in Europe. Obviously, warm weather. They did a nice job about finding other supplies for gas. They cut down on usage. All of that supports their economy. And obviously, the China reopening is pretty significant from that perspective. So that overall growth story is very, I think, supportive of the U.S. growth story decelerating at a slower pace and therefore, again, avoiding any kind of hard landing, but it also supports higher yields across the globe. So that's why we think we're going to be in this range-bound area when you look at the long end of the curve, and we won't see a decline until much later this year. Stephanie, just when it comes to the European equity call, we've heard a lot of that. Where in the European equity story do you want to be? Are you capturing the China reopening, luxury, the miners? Where do you want to be? A lot of it's the luxury. That's a tremendous benefit given... <laughs> China is going to be reopening certainly earlier than anyone expected. So that's that's our favorite area to play it. You're not alone. Luxury, the airlines, even the banks have rallied so hard off the lows of last year. Stephanie Roth, thanks for coming in. We appreciate it. Tony Rodriguez, thank you to you as well, sir, on this bond market, the global economy and these central banks. Yields are up this morning, 390 on a 10-year. Yields up by eight or nine basis points on that maturity. On a two-year, up by seven to just close to 470, 469. Coming up, the morning calls and later, Keith Lerner of Truist expecting the Fed to put a cap on equity valuations. That conversation just around the corner. Equity futures on the S&P about seven minutes away from the open and bow down about nine tenths of one percent as we kick off a brand new trading week. Remember they told us at the start of the year we'd get that break in that correlation between stocks and bonds. We don't have that break, not yet anyway. Equity futures down by about 1%. We're down by 1.3% on the Nasdaq. And guess what Treasuries are doing? They're lower too. Yields are higher. We're playing that game again. Twos, tens and thirties look like this. Close to 470 on a two-year, up seven or eight basis points to 469 on a 10-year. We're back through 390 of nine basis points on the day. That's the price action. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, JP Morgan downgrading AutoNation to underweight. 130 price target, seeing a less attractive risk reward with shares hovering and record highs. That stock is negative by 2.26% in the pre-market. Truist and Grading Generac to hold 145 price target, expecting higher rates and product prices to weigh on upcoming results. That stock is negative about 2.9%. And your final call from HSBC, down at Grading Mosaic to reduce, pointing to weakening demand and growing risk to consensus estimates. That stock also down by about 2.8% to 48 45 Coming up, futures pointed to more declines after two weeks of losses. Truist co-CIO Keith Lerner says it's time to get more defensive as the Fed puts a lid on the rally. You're opening bell next. Twenty-two seconds away from the up and about this morning. Good morning, Tuesday morning, back stateside after a long weekend with equity futures negative one percent on the S&P and the Nasdaq down by about one point three percent. Coming off the back of a two-day losing streak on the S&P and the first two-week loss of 2023. From New York, there's your opening bell. Switch at the board and get to the bond market. Yields up, data better, services, PMIs improve. We're higher by nine basis points on a 10-year. Your 10-year right now, 3.90.58. A touch of dollar strength out there. Euro dollar negative two-tenths of 1%. 106.62. And crude just about holding on. Oh, Seven-tenths of 1%. $76 and about 80 cents. About 15 seconds into this one, we're lower by nine-tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, down by 1.26%. One stock to watch the open Walmart, the world's largest retailer, issuing a disappointing outlook, signaling another rocky year ahead. The CFO said this, there's a great deal of uncertainty looking out to the balance of the year. There's still pressure on the consumer. Our guidance reflects a cautious outlook on the macroeconomic environment. Abby has more. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, it's such an interesting divergence given the fact that we've had some of the luxury items and travel and leisure outperforming. But here we have staples, these big box retailers having a tough time. Walmart, in fact, right now having its worst day of the year, stumbling the most, down the most since November of last year. And it does have to do with that outlook for profits. 
the big deal here is last year it was also a drop for profits, this first time in six years. So now we're looking at two annual slides and profits potentially uh, in a row. Investors really not liking that. It seems that some of the issue, it continues to be the fact that inventories last year, uh, we had that inventory build, that they haven't had a quick rebound out of it. They also misjudged the product mix amid soaring inflation. They had uh, apparel and other items, uh, too much of those items. But it was staples and uh, really the staples that really did much better, including food, groceries. We also had health and uh, wellness, food and groceries up high to mid teens. Overall, just a mid single digit comp. So a similar story for Home Depot. Their uh, do it your home projects are slowing. Apparently they have also forecasted a drop in profits. Part of that is a $1 billion investment to gain and retain uh, quality hourly workers to create the shopper experience that they want for their consumers, their clients. However, considering that drop, uh, that they have a drop in demand, some analysts are saying this is really a risky bet. John, this is incredible. They are looking at a three-tenths of a drop in same store sales. Compare that to 31% higher uh, just in 2021. It's really been a stark turnaround to the downside for Home Depot. Home Depot down 3.7% in early trading. Abby, thanks for that. The outlook for earnings not tremendous. The outlook for labor costs not encouraging. We'll pick up on that story in just a moment. We'll do that as well a little bit later with the Walmart CFO, Kelly and Guy, catching up with John David Rainey a little bit later this morning, 10.30 Eastern time. Look out for that. Look out for this too. Another stock to watch, Manchester United, the bidding war, heating up with Britain's richest man, Jim Ratcliffe, and Elias Paul Singer all getting involved. The deal could represent the biggest takeover of a professional sports club on record. That stock coming in about 3%. Guy Johnson in London on this story. Guy, the bidding, does it continue? Mm -hmm. Uh, it looks like it does, though I have to say the Glazer family look like they're getting quite ticked off as well about some of the comments that are being made about the club. Talk of returning Manchester United to the glory years. Uh, maybe a, a reference to the way that maybe the Glazers have managed the business uh, and maybe the lack of silverware uh, that has generated, been generated during that period. So it's not inconceivable uh, that this sale doesn't go ahead, John. The Glazers actually hang on to the family, uh, as, uh, hang on to this as a family business. Um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Jim Radcliffe, uh, as you can see on the left-hand side of your screen, Britain's richest man, uh, a Manchester United fan. He wants to take the club over. He basically wants to buy out the Glazers, i.e. The, the shares that they own. Uh, but that would involve debt. Uh, you've got uh, Sheikh Jassim as well out of Qatar. Uh, he is talking about a debt-free offer for Manchester United, which would have mean maybe more investment uh, into the club going forward. But then there's the issue as well of the fact that uh, the Qataris also own PSG in Paris, Paris Saint-Germain, and maybe that would be an issue when it comes to European football. A guy just on Elliot, Paul Singer, what's the latest with that? Is that a minority stake he's offering? No, he's not, he's not offering to... He's offering financing, John. He's not offering to buy a stake in the business. Uh, so Elliot's basically talking about providing financing. Um, it, it is not talking about taking a, a direct stake in, in the football club. So, so it is a more of an arm's length uh, element to the story that is coming through. But the US banks, it's fascinating. There's a great story on the terminal today talking about the fact the US banks have really woken up to what is happening with football, with soccer, and are now playing a major part in terms of the financing packages that are being, being offered. But that, that's the Elliott role uh, in, this, in this story. A fascinating. I just wonder, Guy, if that might be the reason why the stock's pulling back today. Uh, maybe, maybe. There's certainly the possibility that, that it doesn't go ahead. It's interesting, Liverpool Football Club, which has been talked about as well as being potentially on the block, um, th that is now no longer going forward. Um, so there are some issues here, and I, and I think the Glaciers are a little annoyed about the fact that, that like Jim, Sir Jim Radcliffe's talking about returning the club to the glory years. I think that probably... Uh, it is annoying a few people within the Glazer family. So maybe they're going to say, you know what, we're going to stick with it. Manchester United are on a great run. Right? People are talking about winning silverware this year. So maybe that would be the moment that they would want to exit. Rashford getting it done. I could continue this for a long time, yeah. Guy. This was fun. Thank you. Let's do this again. Guy Johnson, any excuse to talk about football around the opening bout in New York? Manchester United down about 3.7%. US listed China stocks getting hammered. The nation's biggest internet companies ramping up their spending as Beijing eases its crackdown, fueling fresh margin concerns. Kelly Lines joins us now with more. Hi, Kelly. Hey, John. Yeah, this is the idea that the shackles are coming off after so many of these companies have been really trying to play it low key for so long. Now that Beijing is easing up on that crackdown, they're starting 
to try to compete more heavily. So you are seeing some moves in the market related to this. The most prominent example today, JD.com, those ADR is down about 8.4% right now. The latest news there reportedly is that JD is getting ready to roll out a $1.5 billion subsidy program next month in order to fend off competition from other players like PDD Holdings. That apparently those subsidies will be for both JD self-operated storefronts as well as third parties. And there's other examples of this too, like Meituan expanding in Hong Kong, getting ready to hire 10,000 new workers in mainland China as they embark on a campaign to fend off heightened competition in the food space from players like ByteDance. Then there's also the news we got a few weeks ago of Baidu getting ready to launch its own AI chatbot trying to steal more ad revenue from the likes of Alibaba and Tencent. So these companies are trying to snatch more market share. You aren't seeing, though, a great positive performance for many of these stocks, at least those listed in the U.S. When you look at the ADRs of some of those large cap tech companies as measured by the Golden Dragon China Index, we're now off 11.7 percent from the recent high at the end of January. So Adding to those losses this morning, you have JD, as I said, down about 8%, Baba, Alibaba down about 3%, and Baidu down about 2% in the first few minutes of trading as well, John. Hey, Kelly Lines, welcome back. It's good to have you back down in Washington, D.C., covering some of these regulatory stories for us. Your equity market pulling back a little bit, seven minutes in, down nine-tenths of 1%. Keith Leonard at Truist seeing a lose-lose situation for markets. He wrote the following, we see a reverse tepper trade underway. If the economy stays stronger, central banks will maintain a tight monetary policy, putting a cap on equity valuations. Or if the economy starts to weaken, this will likely translate into lower corporate profits and challenge asset prices. Keith joins us right now. Keith, for those who don't remember, and thanks for being with us, can you remind us of what the Tepper trade was? Sure, Jonathan, and uh, great to be with you. Yeah, in um, 2010, coming out of the financial crisis, the market has started to move up, and there was a lot of angst for the market. And David Tepper came out very succinctly, said we have basically a win-win situation. Either the economy is going to get better, and that's going to help corporate profits and help the stock market, or instead, the, uh, the, uh, the Fed will step in, which will also help the economy. So our point of view, Jonathan, is today is somewhat of the reverse of, of that, in that either the economy is going to get uh, stronger and the Fed's going to stay tighter, as, as, we, as you just alluded to, or, as we saw with Walmart today, that the economy will start to weaken, and that will hurt corporate profits as well. So we, the bottom line is that we think the upside is somewhat capped. And then uh, in the first week of February, we actually uh, took down equities and raised, uh, raised some cash in light of that. So, Keith, a lot of people at the start of the year said the same thing. And now the Nasdaq's up 13 percent, pulled back from those levels this morning, of course, but up double figures. What happened, Keith? Well, I think, uh, I think perspective is, is, is helpful, Jonathan. Um, so the market's had a nice move, you know, as we change the calendar. But look at the S&P. The S&P in mid-December was around 4,100. We're below that today. So what happened, Jonathan, is that we had a sell-off in mid-December, about 5 or 6 percent. You had tax loss selling. As that subsided, the market has come back. But again, if you remove the calendar, we're basically just where we were back in uh, September. And then going to the technology, you know, what we saw, we did an interesting study uh, in January, Jonathan. The, the bottom 50 stocks in the S&P, which were down over 50 percent last year, in January alone were up 40 percent. Every single one of those bottom 50 stocks were up. So what does that tell you? That's not fundamental. That was a mean reversion trade. And part of the reason why we raised cash earlier in, in, uh, in February was thinking that was just, you know, an overdone reversion, uh, not the start of a new bull market, which I guess, you know, is, is the open question out there. But we're on the side that it's not the start of something new. I think that is the open question. So let's go there. It's whether October was the low of this bear market and Keith whether what we've seen year today is the beginning of something new and Keith I'm more interested in how you work out that answer than the answer itself what's the process you go through to try and consider whether October was the low yeah well I think the important thing Jonathan is uh, we have to keep an open mind to different outcomes especially in this post pandemic world so I'll give you the bullish outcome and this is more strictly from more of a technical standpoint you made a low in October that was the same day as a generational high in inflation right so you bottomed on bad news um, over the last several months, you know, you've had a very negative sentiment. Um, and despite that, or, or maybe because of that, you started to move up slowly and surely. You've seen breadth participate or, or boring out quite a bit. You're broken above some technical levels as well. But what holds us back from endorsing that view, and, and, you know, we look at the weight of the evidence, and we look at the macro conditions. You know, this morning, Walmart talked about how uncertain things are in the second half. And we look at the, the fundamental perspective. 
you know, recently you were trading well above an 18 forward multiple. And to put that in perspective is over the last 30 years, you're only able to sustain a level above that twice, the technology bubble or the pandemic overshoot. So the question we have to ask ourselves, is that premium um, valuation warranted given the macro risk? Our view is, is no. The other thing that you would be banking on, uh, Jonathan, is that earnings are going to be much stronger than the street forecast. Well, what are we seeing today? We're seeing the forward earning estimates for the S&P make a 52-week low while valuations are at a premium. That's, that's not a combination for, for a large upside move in our view. Walmart recovering just a little bit. We've mentioned that stock a few times this morning. It's now down just eight tenths of one percent. Keith, the other aspect of all of this is just history. Miss Laf Mateka at JP Morgan kicked off the week with this line. We've never seen a low before the Fed has stopped hiking. How important is that line, Keith? Well, it's important. We've actually used, uh, we, did, we have done similar analysis. To be fair, Jonathan, um, we've also had, uh, you know, a 25 percent peak to trough correction, which is abnormal before a recession even begins. As an example, so I think you know the forward guidance that the Fed has. I mean, that's changed things because things filter into the market so much quicker. So I do think about that aspect, but overall, I do agree that um, you know history does show that it would be unusual for the market to have the low end based on that. Uh, but even if let's forget let's forget about that for a second. Let's forget about you know hard landing or soft landing. You know, the market at, at this point, in our view, is banking in a very good scenario with little margin for error. And even if you say, yes, we're in the soft landing camp, well, the market, in our view, is already pricing that in, both on the equity side. And then you look at credit spreads, which are extremely tight, also not baking in much recession risk either. So we just think the downside risk is higher than the upside risk. And that's why, again, we're more defensive in our overall posture today. The so-called reverse temper trade. Keith, this was great. Don't be a stranger. It's always great to catch up. Keith Lerner there of Truist. Thank you, sir. About 12 or 13 minutes into this session. Equity's pulling back. We're off the lows, though. We're down 8 tenths of 1% on the S&P and the Nasdaq. We're down about 9 tenths of 1%. Coming up, Credit Suisse, the chairman, speaking to Bloomberg, back in December. The outflows basically have stopped. What we saw is two, three weeks in October, boom. And since then, flattening out, they have stopped. It's gradually coming back, in particular in Switzerland. Those comments said to be leading to some regulatory scrutiny. We'll have that conversation next. The outflows basically have stopped. What we saw is two, three weeks in October, boom. And since then, flattening out, they have stopped. It's gradually coming back, in particular in Switzerland. That was the Credit Suisse chairman, Axel Lehman, speaking to Bloomberg and Francine Lacroix back in December. Shares this morning hitting a fresh record low after Reuters reports that the regulator in Switzerland is investigating whether those remarks misled investors. Credit Suisse declined to comment on the report. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Jan Patrick Barnett in Frankfurt. Jan Patrick, always fantastic to get your perspective. What's happening here? Oh, well, it's horrible to to uh, watch Fred Swiss unable to get anything right, and and now with the the last thing that they want right now is is regulatory uh, scrutiny, and especially this incident probably has no good outcome for Fred Swiss because either uh, the management has been untruthful uh, about what outflows uh, are are actually looking, so that's an obvious red flag, or if they have been right and just unlucky with the timing of the comments, and then outflows uh, resumed shortly after, it shows you that the management is unable to do anything to to stop that bleeding for the bank. So whatever it is. It's probably not good for the bank. If you look at the share price, it's down tremendously in that in a time when all other banks are rallying uh, on based on the on the higher yields. So Credit Suisse really has an issue here to renew trust from investors and from the clients. And uh, if I have to make a prediction, I would uh, would say that this probably is going on for for a little bit longer because right now, as I said, the bank is just unable to get anything right here. The 260 on the stock does not look good. We're down another 4%. Jan Patrick, thank you. Joining us now to discuss is Filippo Anoati, the head of financials at Federated Hermes. Filippo, mm -hmm. fantastic to speak to you, sir, as always. There's one question I had, Filippo, just reading this story. Those remarks were made right before the close of a $4 billion capital raise. And I wonder, Filippo, whether he was communicating the same thing, whether the company was communicating the same thing to the people who bought into that capital raise. 
Yeah, I think it's uh, it's a bit complicated. So I think I saw the chair and we just uh, heard again this, uh, what he said. He was uh, on purpose a little bit vague. And I mean, so you can argue that um, in some part of the um, Credit Suisse group, like for example in Switzerland, as he mentioned, they were already, the deposit actually were reverting. And also he's mentioned flattening out. So these are mathematical terms, a second derivative. So you can say that on purpose or it's been a little bit vague. And of course, I mean, we know that was the, the rights they were pricing because then they, I think they only sat around the 10th of December, so before the interview with Francine. So it was a bit, uh, uh, should I say, it's, I think it's one of half glass, half full, half uh, empty type of the situation. And I think one of the duty of the chair is also to instill confidence in the group. And I think it was uh, playing this part of instilling confidence in, in, the, in the group. It's also taken our attention back to a difficult time for the bank and taken our attention away from where the bank is right now. Filippo, I wonder what the inflows outflow situation looks like currently. What's your read on that? Yeah, I think it's uh, this situation, and that's based on the Q4 uh, number they disclosed uh, a few weeks back. It has stabilized, but it has stabilized at the cost to the PL of the group because so we know there's been some, uh, I would say, punchy marketing campaign both in Switzerland and in, uh, in Asia Pacific in order to get those deposit back. And I think so in this kind of situation, that's what you want to, uh, them to do in order to stabilize the, um, say, the funding profile of the group and have. Uh, uh, these uh, uh, outflows, uh, so consign these outflows things to, to the past. And I think, so yeah, it's a, it's a difficult job in trying to achieve and uh, uh, to say that uh, they all get things wrong, I think it's a little bit too simplistic. Felipe, just a know. final one from me, if I may. This year is a write-off for the bank. Based on the communication we've had, it looks like 2023 is going to be very difficult to make profit. 2024 seems to be the next landing point. How difficult will it be to turn around the bank even in the next 12 months? I think it will be difficult if the execution risk is high. And I think also they've been very upfront, at least in the Q4 call, saying uh, we'll make a huge loss in 2023. It's possible also 24 will be another difficult year. And then also they're only forecasting a, a relatively pedestrian return on tangible equity by 2025. So it will take some time. And I think also we've been there with previous situations, like for example, NatWest, Deutsche Bank, Danske Bank to some extent. So it's uh, uh, it takes time, it takes patience, and uh, I think the best thing for Credit Suisse is to just stay out of the news for quite some time, but it will be difficult. <laughs> They're struggling to do just that. Filippo Aluati of Federated Hermes. Filippo, thank you, sir. Stock's down 4%. Stock's trading at 266. We actually had some decent data around Europe earlier this morning on the services side. Mike McKee, we're seeing a very, very similar story out of the U.S. this morning. <laughs> We are indeed, John. One of your guests at the top of the show was making the case that a recession may be coming because the January data were unusually and, and maybe uh, strangely strong. This is February data. The S&P Global Manufacturing PMI comes in better than expected, up from last month, 47.8 compared with 46.9. Now, that's not too bad. It is a bit of good news. But you look at what's happened with services and composite PMI, both of them back over 50. The services PMI goes up to 50.5 from 46.8, a significant move. 50.2 for the composite, also from 46.8. So two significant moves in the services and composite that put us back into expansion territory for February. This matches what we've seen going on in Europe. You mentioned that. Uh, almost every country there had the same story as the United States with France, Germany, the Eurozone, and the UK seeing manufacturing still below 50, although a little bit better, but services in all of those countries higher than 50 now, and the composite in all of those countries higher than 50 now. So it does look like there is more strength in the global economy. And I got to say, uh, it may be showing that Christine Lagarde is not the most powerful woman in the European economy. It may be Mother Nature. What analysts are suggesting, and that may be true in the United States as well, is that the winter has been mild enough that people have had extra money they would have spent on natural gas or other utilities yep. to spend, and they haven't been kept inside by storms. So maybe this year is a Mother Nature year to watch. At least the first couple of months of the year, anyway. Mike, thanks for that. The weather component of the year so far, the data's just been tremendous. I remember at the start of the year, we had sub-50 PMIs on S&P Global, looking at the US, 
and credit spreads were at 400 basis points on high yield. And I said to Gershon Distant Found of AB, this does not make sense. And he said to me, one of two things needs to happen. Either spreads are going to gap out wider again, or the PMIs are going to recover. What we're seeing right now is the PMIs starting to recover. Watch this space. Your equity market down another 1%. Up next, your trading diary. The PMIs worldwide looking pretty good relative to expectations and relative to where they have been. Equities off the back of better data lower because yields are higher. We're down 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq. We're down a little more than one full percentage point as well. That's the price action. Here's your trading diary coming up. President Biden set to speak in Poland, 11.30 Eastern time. Fed minutes on Wednesday. Look out for that tomorrow. We'll hear from President's boss, Dix Daly of the Fed, speaking on Thursday. Plus, we get US GDP, core PCE, another round of jobless claims as well. And finally, new home sales, personal income and spending numbers and you Mitch sentiment survey to round out the week. That rounds out the morning for me. Good morning. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.